right, well, all right. So, uh, first of all, first of all, I want to uh, speak on something uh, has to do with my mother. Um, she's changed her life, and you know, my mother's my rock, and basically been there for me this whole term. And you know, I love my mom to death, and I mean no disrespect at all. Uh, you know, it's her life along with the rest of us, and you know, I really do appreciate that. She's never left me hanging ever. So uh, I'm just telling my story, you know. We all make mistakes, but, you know, like it says, it's never too late, you know, to change. So I just wanted to make that very clear. Uh, also, man, before I get started on this next one, uh, I would like to, uh, first and foremost, I'm not doing this to promote gangs or gang violence. In fact, uh, my goal is quite the opposite. Uh, I want to show people what a waste of time my life was pushing politics and having no empathy whatsoever. Um, a little bit about myself, I'm actually now working on a bachelor degree in human services, which is ironic, and now giving back to the streets that I've terrorized for years, um, creating my own workshop program for youth involved in gangs and, you know, plan on helping kids not follow my path. You know, I grew up in the system and learned violence at a pretty young age, you know, and in the system. I'm human like everyone else, you know, I just turn left where you turn right. I'm paying for my mistakes I cause, and I cause a serious negative ripple effect in my community. So now I'm turning that around and want to uh, leave a more positive ripple effect in my wake. So I'm working on uh, two college degrees, two internships. I facilitate several self-help groups. Uh, I'm also a certified counselor, uh, domestic violence specialist, and anger management specialist. Um, as well. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. I'm also working on my drug and alcohol counselor right now, which I have thousands of hours already logged under clinical supervision. Uh, this is my life now, man, and that's that's pretty much who I am. You know, I'm not going to get on here and, you know, beg for sodas or soups. I'm well taken care of. Uh, the only thing I could use or ask for help on would be, like, college supplies or maybe books. Um, also, I'm eligible for resentencing under 1170D for extreme good behavior. Um, I have about seven years left, but under this new law, I can I can file to, uh, you know, get out for the good behavior. So, um, you know, I'm interested if anybody's interested in uh, helping out with an attorney or an attorney's interested in helping pro bono. I'm my own paralegal, so I can pretty much do all the footwork. Uh, that's pretty much... Uh, all I could ask on that, and uh, you know, uh, I no longer live by. You know, I educate myself with knowledge and write my book, and pretty much stay out of the way. You know, I know there will be people who don't vibe with my jive, but I can't really please everybody. You know, and I wish you all well who struggle with real life addictions. You know, remember, you guys are the real soldiers. You know, who maneuver the landmines of everyday life. I respect it and I support it. And if I can help one person or one kid, I achieve my goal. Well, it can't always be rainbows and butterflies, so let's get back to the real stories. Um, so I want to get started. Uh, I'm just going to kind of give you a little idea of, you know, what it was like and stuff. So pretty much, uh, so P&I was pretty much a gang that started out in the early 90s in Orange County. You know, in the beginning, it was more of a family thing than, than a gang. You know, it was a bunch of us kids that had messed up childhoods like myself and wanted to be loved and feel like we were wanted, you know. And I was rejected a lot as a kid and, you know, uh, or, you know, some of us were abused and just wanted to be, you know, superior or in control or, uh, you know, feel like I had some type of say, you know, and I got what I wished for. And then some as the years went by. So P9 Rudimentary was originally a band in Long Beach that blew up into a gang. Pretty much the uh, power I held started the day I was jumped in, and my reputation was built from there. You know, we were recognized from the gate as people, you know, and people feared us. Obviously, we had a nasty reputation for home invasion-style robberies on drug connections, you know, but we didn't discriminate either, obviously. You know, we used the home home girls or any girls for that matter to help us get inside the doors and you know get in places and stuff and when we set dudes up uh i'll give you an example uh so i met a chick 
out there that was, you know, she was in the dope scene and pretty much literally robbed every connect she knew in a week. And uh, this chick, you know, this chick loved me. She tripped out on how, you know, I had no problem working alone. You know, all she had to do was get the door open pretty much and it was on. So uh, I was actually married at the time. You know, I probably would have ended up with this chick because I was down with the Bonnie and Clyde thing, but, you know, it just wasn't wasn't the right time, I guess. But, uh, you know, and then after being told on by most of my homeboys and stuff, it, it, it kind of makes me think back. I probably should have kept my circle smaller, you know, and I probably would have been better off anyway. <laughs> so she calls me and, uh, you know, we go to Huntington Beach to plan a job. And I call Corn Fed, who later became my co-defendant, and several other cases years later. You know, so the chick tells me about this dude, Noel, uh, who thinks he's a baller. You know, the dude had been bragging he he knew me to this chick, and I never heard of the dude. So I tell her, hey, let's go meet him and see, you know. I'll just pull up next to him and see if he, you'll see right there he's lying because he's not going to recognize me or whatever. So, you know, we meet him. I pull right up next to his car. You know, I'm like, hey, what's up, bro? You know, how are you? And, you know, I told him my name was Wayne. And I'm all, do we know each other? And, he, you know, the dude's like, oh, no, I've never never seen you before in my life. So I told him, hey, so uh, just so you know, I'm Bullet, bro. And, you know, you might want to be careful, you know, whose name you're dropping. You know, and that was pretty much my excuse right there to go ahead and end up getting this dude later or whatever. And uh, so I kind of just told him, yeah, just just take that as a warning, you know, advice or whatever, and, you know, we'll pass on it this time or whatever, which I really wasn't planning on letting it go, but I wanted him to be comfortable. And uh, so later that night, I, I told this girl, you know, hey, call him up, man, let's order, let's order an ounce and see if he'll meet us. Well, the dude was all paranoid and stuff, and, and uh, you know, he didn't really, he didn't really want to... Uh, you know, he didn't really want to meet or anything, so he was kind of scary or whatever. So I told her, well, find out, you know, if he'll let us come over there or whatever, I'm, I'm down. That way, you know, we can make sure that this dude actually does know me. <laughs> you know, next time he says my name, he, he'll be able to be telling the truth. And uh, so we end up going to uh, this pad in Huntington Beach, and, you know, so me, her, and Corn Fed go in. And it's this house, it's some chick's house, and... Uh, this dude Noel, he's sitting in there wearing this big old straw hat, and you know we're just sitting across from him, and uh, he gives an ounce of dope to her, she gives it to me, which was pretty much our cue for go time, and uh, so I pulled out my gun and you know told him to get on the ground, which he complied and everything, and you know this chick started screaming and trying to run to her phone, saying she's calling 911. Well. Uh, we're kind of, I'm I'm actually kind of freaking out because, uh, you know, I personally don't commit violence against women, and I know Corn Fed didn't, wasn't down with that either, so, uh, you know, Felicia ended up jumping in and taking care of business or whatever, which was, was good, you know, for us, and uh, so I've always pretty much been a leader, you know, and instead of a follower, so anyway, I tell uh, this dude Noel to give me all the dope, and Put put everything in this little uh, goofy hat that he had that he was wearing, and so the dude puts everything in the hat, money, dope, whatever. And we end up uh, telling the dude, "Look, nothing personal. This was business, man, for using my name and stuff." And, uh, the dude ended up calling later, and uh, he kind of asked me if, uh, basically, for protection because you know he was he was slinging quite a bit of drugs at the time and. Uh, you know, he didn't want to get robbed again, so, uh, you know, I told him, yeah, that's fine, let's go ahead and do that, uh, you know, so <clears throat> every time he was doing something now, I pretty much kind of got a percentage of it, and that was just like the beginning stages of that, and that was one thing that we did a lot was uh, we would we would rob people like that, you know, basically just to get our claws in them. So that they knew if they wanted to continue on, you know, they had to pay us to, to do it. So basically that was just extortion at its finest. And, you know, that was just an example of, of how, you know, we established that with people. We would rob them and basically go from there. But, uh, you know, it's kind of ironic, you know, because 
the dude ended up actually, you know, he actually ended up being a cool dude down the road. And, you know, when I got busted and stuff, he actually did a lot of stuff for me. And that was kind of like our everyday life, you know, on the streets. And, um, you know, pretty much from the time that, the time I was being I was different because the power and respect followed. You know, I would always get the keys when I hit the county or while I was out <clears throat> on the streets. So I was always leading somehow, you know, and I was good at it because I have a clear head and I'm humble and always respected people above or below me. Trust me, not everybody, you know, is a good leader or, you know, a good leader in position or whatever. You know, some people use the power to settle personal issues because they can't stand on their own two feet. You know, if you're a leader, you shark on all your own people, then you're left standing alone, uh, you know, against the enemy. Like, most people don't think that way, you know, or plan that far ahead, but I always did. And, you know, people just respected that about me. You know, and some guys get power, and they want to be disrespectful to... uh like other good dudes, and just because they weren't penine, that's not that's not a uh, good leader strategy. You know, uh, I'd rather have a whole army on the team versus a few of my homeboys. It's all common sense, you know. <laughs> but uh, some people just lack that common sense. And, uh, so, so I ended up uh, getting in a fight with my girl, and you know, she wouldn't stop nagging me. So uh, we were at a stoplight, and I just got out of the car, and. Uh, walked across the street to a car dealership and you know my girl ended up parking right there and, and waited thinking I was going to just check out some cars and you know hop back across the street and go home or whatever so I had the dude give me the keys fire up the car it was a 300 this call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded you know at, at the time they were uh, they were nice cars and fast you know so I peel out and took off through the little gate and uh, you know, went, my my mom's is actually down the street, so I took off through the gate and ended up taking it and parking it in the garage. And I just did this because I was, like I said, I was tired of hearing my girl nag, and I just wanted to just get on and go, and uh, which was stupid. Well, little did I know it was a carjacking because the door hit the dude as I was going out. The door just barely tapped him. And uh, so, you know, the cops clumped it up. So I left the car sitting for a couple mornings, and um, they had had an APB out, you know, on the car. So I took off early in the morning a couple days later, go to my buddy Todd's pad, and, and uh, PD had a carjacking warrant or APB on the car. They didn't know who I was yet. They just were looking for the car. And uh, they spotted me on Beach in Orange. So I ended up taking them on a wild ride, you know, through town and stuff. And I ended up passing passing my mom's house just to let her know, hey, they're, they're, I'm going to jail. You guys will pretty much know where to find me. And I went down this street called Gilbert, which was a, uh, it actually dead ended, you know, and it runs into the railroad tracks right there. And uh, I actually went through the fence. You know, the cops were still behind me, and I ended up going through the fence. And I didn't know at the time that the fence had went over the top of the car, and you know the cops ended up not being able to follow me through. So I'm I'm hauling ass, going fast, and this, the chopper is the only thing I can see up above me. But I'm going fast because I'm trying to get to these little sewer tunnels, which were right down the street from my old house where I grew up. You have 60 seconds remaining. We used to escape, you know, through the tunnels and stuff. So, um, yeah, there, so there used to be these little sewer tunnels, and, you know, we used to get away all the time when we were kids. And I was actually trying to get to there, and that's why I went through the fence and down the tracks and stuff. And I, I didn't know that the cars that were behind me, the cop cars, I didn't know they were stopped at the gate. So I'm in this dirt between the tracks uh, right next to the railroad tracks, and I'm doing 80 miles an hour and not really paying attention. And... Uh, I ended up hitting some railroad ties, and anyway, it ended up, uh, I was ejected from the car, and, you know, the car had rolled a few times, and pretty much uh, woke up with the chopper was right there, like above me, kicking dust on me, basically just telling me not to move, you know, for my sake, because I was hurt, <laughs> uh, you know, and it, I actually laid there for quite a while, I think the cops a long time to actually get there, because it was, you know, they were trying to figure out how to get back there and stuff. 
and uh, they finally get there and arrest me and stuff. And I was hurt and uh, ended up going to the UCI medical ward for about a week or two, and then I went to the Orange County Jail. So, you know, since I had been brought into Peni, so this was my first time that I had been in the county since I was jumped in. So the way things changed from before was uh, I basically got to BMOD and took the keys ASAP because the rules were if anyone from Peni hit any mod, you know, they got the keys. You know, so this was my first experience with that. Pretty much because, uh, you know, Popeye was up in ADSEG and so he would want all his boys to have keys wherever, you know, throughout the jail. The same way that I ended up doing it years later for myself. And uh, this was short-lived because uh, we ended up getting word from Popeye on this this dude named Clumsy that was there, you know, that he was all bad. And I didn't have any homeboys there <clears throat> at the time. Uh, the only dude that was there was a dude from NLR, Ricky. Uh, he was a good-ass dude. And, you know, he was my boy and stuff. And, uh, anyway, so we... This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. We ended up getting this dude in the day room and stomped him out. And the dude was unconscious, and pretty much, like, we stayed on him and uh, pretty much just kept stomping him out and jumping on him, and it was just bad. And uh, so this was pretty much my first first assignment, so... Uh, and y'all in the county for Popeye, so of course I wanted to make sure I came through and did a good job. And, uh, you know, Popeye was in ADSEG, and so this dude, uh, Clumsy, he was out for a long time, and, you know, we're, we're cleaning everything up, cleaning the blood, because the cop kept walking, you know, every few minutes he would do his little walks and stuff, and, uh, so we're literally doing weekend at Bernie's with this dude. He's like sitting up on the pole, and I'm like, next to him, holding him up, and he's flopping back and forth, you know, there's two guys, one on each side, literally having to hold him up as the cops go by, you know, we're sitting right in front of the TV like we're watching TV, and um, the cop had ended up seeing the blood, actually, you know, someone else was cleaning that up, and um, he pretty much said, hey, man, is it over? He didn't know this, the severity of it at the time, and he's like, is it over? And we're like, oh, yeah, it's done, it was personal or whatever, it's over with, and, so he carries on, and we end up uh, we end up getting this dude back to his cell. Like he was out for a while, and finally got him to. And we end up getting him to his cell. And uh, I don't know, it was probably probably uh, I don't know, maybe three or four hours later, they were calling man down in the cell. So they came and they took dude out. I guess uh, his brain ended up swelling up and they had to cut his skull open and all kinds of stuff to drain the fluids and like the dude almost died and he's he's like pretty much was pretty much brain dead at the time he had a lot of damage done and ended up in a coma and uh so it ended up being all bad the cops ended up pulling a few white dudes out about one in the morning that night just beating them one by one you know i got mine later of course but it didn't take them long before they knew, you know, it was me and Rick, and, uh, you know, I ended up getting the business later. You know, and they moved uh, they moved Rick to Theo Lacey, and, you know, they thought they were punishing me. They said, okay, you want to be a little shot caller? Okay, cool, we're going to send you up, you know, where it's really happening at, and, uh, if you want to call shots or whatever. So they ended up sending me to Ad Sig, you know, with the big dogs, and I actually loved it, man. I was next to all the big homies and mobsters and learn what real politicking was, you know, pretty much at the highest level right there. And this was pretty much the training ground for me, you know, and I was in on everything. You know, I was with Popeye and my homeboy, Ballistic, rest in peace, who became one of my best friends, um, you know, and, and we were all in ATSEG together. You know, people were in and out of there and stuff, other homeboys and stuff. And, uh, you know, I learned what roll call was, you know, and what it's for, and, you know, basically that's our way of keeping track of who was where, you know, we also have the hard candy list, which means the hit list, you know, people targeted for death or, at the very least, uh, assault, you know, very minimum. So the way it worked is uh, every mod in the jail had a key holder. So the mod is split up in six pods, and every pod has a guy that takes roll call and gives it to the dude in charge of the mod, which consists of six pods. 
So it's pretty much that dude's responsibility to get the roll call to us through court. So we keep an updated list. You know, we look over the list and cross-reference it with the hit list, basically. You know, and then if somebody's on there, then we send out the orders the same route back through court to whoever was needed to get the job done. This is just an example of how my life was, you know, living in the county jail and learning the stuff that I was learning. And, you know, I've also shared earlier a little bit on how it was how it was on the streets, you know, and I was already robbing and stealing before I became P9, so not much change in that department, uh, but what did change was the respect people had, you know, and I was always on call for duty if needed, you know. For example, if one of us got busted back then, you know, the rest of us would do what we could for each other. Um, as I said, back then we were more like family, you know, and would help one another with bail or our girls and family or whatever. Uh, later, though, that, you know, became tainted. You know, when we got busted, dudes were sharking on your girl and your money and your hustle and everything you had. You know, dudes were stealing your clothes. Like, it just it just got bad. You know, and this, honestly, was 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 not in my blood at all, man. I wasn't down with that, that type of get down at all, you know, and uh, which kind of made my decision a lot easier later down the road to leave the gang and, you know, bump up or whatever. And, uh, you know, we'd also have meetings on the street, you know, and there was a few of us out there. You know, we would uh, meet at, you know, we would meet at one of the spots or at a park in Costa Mesa. I can remember a couple times going there. But I remember having a meeting at this park in uh, Costa Mesa, and then we ended up going to this club. Uh, It was called Club Mesa. And ended up getting in a, me- a melee there. Um, so anyway, there was this club, like I said, it was called Club Mesa. And before they stopped it due to violence, pretty much, they had white power bands on Friday night. You know, we all show up in our skinhead attire, banging, you know, laces and red laces and white laces, whatever your preference was. And, you know, I had heard of uh, shark skins, which for you that don't know, that means skinheads against racial prejudice prejudice and I had heard about them but like I had never met any or seen any and you know they come in all different races and colors and whatever they're just it's just a mixed uh mixed bunch you know and uh we got to the club man and there was a gang of these dudes banging purple aces you know and we we were way outnumbered and like I already knew it was going to be all bad <laughs> uh we didn't get time for the bands to get started and it was on you know, I'm not going to lie, man, like, I, I got, you know, like I said, I can fight a little bit, but I got the business that night, you know, because we were outnumbered pretty much four to one, and I had to be saved a couple times, and I had to help save the other homeboys a couple times or two, you know, and uh, until we can get out of there and get away before the cops got there, you know, and that was, that was honestly, that was just the first time there. The next time, um, uh, you know, I got gotten gaffled up with one of my homeboys, Ballistic, and uh, like I said, rest in peace. Uh, parole had been watching. They they started getting the wind that people were hanging out there, and they were actually, they were looking for Devlin. And, uh, but they, you know, had gotten wind that they were having uh, having these white power nights and what, whatnot, so they figured that's a good way for them to get pictures and whatever, you know, whatever they need for their little investigations and stuff. And uh, we didn't know they were posting up, taking pictures of us. And uh, So me and my homeboy got, Ballista got violated, and they drove us straight to Chino, Palm Hall. Uh, I had still owed a shoe term for a stabbing at Donovan, so every violation I did was pretty much in the hall at Chino, which was Palm Hall. The way that works is if you get a five-year shoe term but only have a couple years left to serve, and... Um, you know, if you get out, you still owe whatever time was left on that shoe term. So every violation or even new term, you continue your shoe where you left off. So the term before I served my time at Susanville first term, which I, I was a real low level when I first went to prison. I started out at low level because I only had, you know, a couple years or whatever, and uh, which that didn't last too long. And, uh, I ended up getting a couple years for that high-speed chase, which was the first time I had went, you know, up to prison or whatever. And, um, so I ended up going out to court, 
And this is kind of just, you know, like I said, a little glimpse of how my life changed being a gang member, you know. Like, I had more responsibilities and more obligations that weren't there before. And uh, so I ended up going out to court uh, a couple of months after I'd gotten to uh, Susanville. Um, I went to San Diego County Jail and basically got my time ran concurrent, which means I didn't get no extra time. It was just I had to go back through San Diego's uh, process, which was you had to go through their George Bailey facility, then across the street to Donovan, and then from there back to uh, Susanville. Well, I never made it back. Um, I ended up picking up a shoe term. And um, I had the reason I was in San Diego is uh, I was drunk one night and uh, I ended up bailing out on this case. And there was a cop car at a car dealership in the back, and we hopped the fence, and we were in this car dealership, and I was trying to jack stuff out of this cop car, and we ended up getting arrested that night. Like, to this day, I still don't even know why I was doing what I was doing. It was just, once we seen the cop car, it just looked like something interesting would have to be in there, you know? And, uh, like I said, I was smashed drunk and really didn't even know why or what we were doing. And, uh, so I got cracked and ended up bailing out on that case. So that case was unresolved once I ended up getting in my uh, high-speed chase and going to prison for that. And then uh, so I went to prison for the high-speed chase, and then they wanted to resolve that case and pulled me back and stuff. And uh, So when I was done with my case in Dago, uh, I went through uh, Donovan Reception, which that was basically the reception center at the time for San Diego. And I went to 16 block first because, you know, that's where everybody goes until they either shoot you to another block or the gym. And um, at the time, the yards were labeled one through four, and I was on the four yard at that time. Now they're uh, labeled like A through D, I believe, instead of one through four. Uh, This was over 25 years ago, so, like, I know things probably changed a lot since back then. Uh, the four yard was cracking though, and fools were getting blasted all the time, mostly chomos, because the reception yard was only one yard. So there's really no place to hide. If you're a chomo or whatever, and you're coming, you know, through the county, everyone knew everyone coming from the county. And uh, so I was a skin from P9 this time now, so, you know, uh, I was basically in the mix right away. And myself, and there was this kid. A uh, bouncer there from San Diego who claimed he was brought into Peni by some of the homeboys. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. You have 60 seconds remaining. I honestly never confirmed that, but I mean, I just took him at his word and I had heard about him and stuff, but uh, I kicked it with him for a minute. And, uh, uh, anyway, like I said back then, it was, you know, the skins were the haters, so I already knew what time it was. Uh, the first thing I got caught up in and got away with uh, was because I felt bad for this kid. Uh, his name was Helmet. He was a little-ass kid, and he got caught smoking snipes. Like, for those of you that don't know what snipes are, they're, they're cigarette butts. That's what we call them in prison. <laughs> well, the rules were, you know, we didn't eat, drink, or smoke pretty much after anybody. And that's that was like the general rule and it was enforced like you definitely you really get stabbed for it <laughs> so the kid got in trouble because no one knew who snipes you know they were he was smoking and he was sharing with people and he, he's lucky honestly that somebody didn't actually stab him just for that reason alone you know someone he shared with or whatever so uh, he had a check coming which pretty much you know that means he had a choice he can get stabbed or he was up for the next thing smoking which means he would stab the next person needing to be stabbed uh, he immediately agreed to put in work. But here's the thing uh, about putting in work. You know, a guy can volunteer because he wants to earn his bolts or whatever. But if you owe cleanup like this dude did, that was just basically to reset his status back to good because he had messed up, you know. He wouldn't be able to go get bolts tattooed on him after he stabbed the dude, you know, because he was in trouble just doing cleanup, basically. So anyway, a week or two it went by, and his number came up. But the Chomo was a big guy, man, and, and this kid was little. It, it, it was crazy. <laughs> like, I, all I could see was the cop shooting this kid, you know, and you know, I just felt bad. And just the fact that he had the heart to do it, you know, and he was going to do it, it earned my respect. And 
so I told him, man, look, I'm going to help you out. And uh, at the time, like Donovan, it was the gunners were killing us, man. And, and there was a chick in the tower that had already killed two dudes in like within the last couple of months. And it was a big thing going on, their investigation and whatever. So I ended up getting the kid a knife. And, you know, as anyone at Donovan uh, who's been there, you know, been to Donovan knows they have lots of rocks. Uh, it's actually right by a rock quarry over there. So, you know, I got a good-sized uh, rock and ended up stuffing that in a sock and doubling up the socks and stuff. And uh, we ended up getting two dudes to stage a fight, which was all the way across the yard. Uh, in front of building 16 is where the tower was at. And we're all the way over. I lived actually in building 18 at the time. And so we're in front of building 18 where the dude's sitting at the bench. And uh, so I'm sitting on the table in front of 18, kind of just waiting. I slid up next to the dude and just waited. And, you know, helmet was like posted up real close by, just waiting basically for the queue. So we knew once the fight started in the in front of the tower and they called yard down that they were paying attention to that. So as soon as they started getting down and stuff and fighting, you know, they called the yard down. I cracked the dude in the head with the rock, and he hit the ground, and I just basically jumped on the dude, grabbed him from behind, and held him in a little chokehold, and then the kid ended up just going to work, you know, and we're kind of under... This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. For anyone that's been there, there's a table in front of 18, and it's, it's like a... It's like a picnic table, but it's all cement. So we're like right down underneath that, kind of blocked by the tower a little bit. And I'm holding the dude down. And Little Helmet's a little kid, man. He's just on him, you know, stabbing him. So we were kind of blocked. But they were paying attention. All the cops were running to the fight anyways. And uh, we had already told the dude's fighting, you know, don't stop until they, they hit three blocks. Because at that time, you know, the general rule was three blocks. And then the mini came out, you know, you got to get down. And uh, so we told him not to stop, you know, until the mini came out. So we had a little bit of time. And uh, basically, if the tower would have seen a weapon, you know, you're not going to get that three-block courtesy. <laughs> so we had to get it done, basically. And, you know, the kid stabbed him a gang of times, and I pushed the dude off me. And, I, just, uh, you know, he's leaking pretty good and stuff. And I just told him, look, just stay down, man, just stay down. And, you know, the yard was already down. Just stay down, just just relax, you know, whatever, it's over with. And uh, so the dude's just laying there, leaking, and, and you know, uh, no one's seen, none of the cops had seen anything, because they're, like I said, they're still attending to the fight that was over in front of the tower across the yard. Uh, the problem was I had blood all over me, and this dude had crapped his pants, man, and I had crap and blood all over me in the front. I didn't have a shirt on, so, you know, I'm trying to, like, wipe as much off as I can with dirt, and it, it's just, it's disgusting, man. I, I, I don't really personally trip on blood, man, but having this dude's crap all over me, it was nasty. And anybody that knows me knows I'm an OCD freak anyway. Like, if I walk a lap on the track, I got to shower. Like, I just feel dirty or whatever. So this was, like, really getting my head or whatever. Uh, it was killing me, man. <laughs> so... You know, I was just helping the kid out, and you know, I get I get the crap end of it, but so, uh, you know, the kid didn't get, you know, shot or beat up or nothing, so everything was good, you know, and uh, the yard resumed, and you know, they took the dudes away that were fighting. The dude's still laying there, you know, right kind of under the bench right there, and I was in building 18, so I was right there. They recalled the yard, so it was perfect. I just threw a shirt on, which somebody gave me. I didn't even have a shirt. And I just walked back into the building and uh, pretty much just took a shower and bird bath and, and cleaned up. And I was honestly, I was waiting for him to come get me. You know, I thought for sure somebody was going to snitch or whatever and we were going to be done. And uh, nothing ha ended up happening, so we ended up getting away with that. <laughs> so, you know, keep in mind, like, I'm out to court, like, with less than a year till I parole. You know, at that time, Donovan reception, like, took forever to get a transfer. So I was there for a couple months already. And the dude that had the yard was blessed by the brand, you know, with the keys. And he had mentioned that, uh, you know, a hit on some dude that did some foul teenage girl. And the girl's parents were actually paying him as somebody that, that he had, you know, talked to through the bend or whatever. 
they actually wanted to pay to have this dude got, you know. And uh, the dude hadn't arrived yet. He was already sentenced, and, you know, he was at uh, George Bailey facility kind of waiting to cross over to Donovan. And uh, so I raised my hand for the hit, but I kind of passed on the money because he'll be able to do that had the yard. Uh, he got broke off a gang of time, man, and I only had seven months. And uh, I think they struck this dude out, this dude hillbilly out for nothing and gave him a, like a hundred plus years or something. So I felt bad for the dude and, you know, the fact that I was going home and I liked the dude and looked up to him. So I told him, just go ahead and keep the money. I got it, you know. So we waited and uh, waited for the dude to show up. And like I said, everybody goes to building 16. So the dude gets there, goes to 16 block. And they ended up getting him moved over to 18 blocks. So that way I had access to the dude. And uh, This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. So I knew I was going to get caught on this one, so I was just going to run with it or whatever. So the only best place to get him was at Medline, you know. And so I wait. <clears throat> I wait until the time's right. And, you know, we would get our meds in front of the gym. And... It was probably, it was like actually way, the gym was right by 20 block, or I think 19 block. Anyway, it's it's farthest away. It's like the farthest building away, and uh, the tower is in front of 16 blocks. So I had quite a bit of distance, and, you know, like I just had to be careful because the gun tower, um, if they if they spot a weapon, basically they're, they're going to shoot me, you know what I mean? And, um, like, I didn't. Obviously, I was trying to get killed before I went seven months left. So uh, I was trying to hopefully make them assume it was a fight. And there was a lot of people around in the kill line and stuff too, which would kind of block as much as possible. So uh, anyway, they released Building 18. You know, it's where I lived, and uh, you know, we end up uh, actually first before before I had. Uh, Ended up doing the job. I got laced up and basically had to uh, uh, pack my prison safe, you know, with a bunch of kites and razor blades and tobacco to take the fellows to the back because I knew I was going to the hole. And, uh, you know, and I knew I was going to ride this dude to the dirt until they got me off him pretty much like I had no choice. And so it's med call and, you know, just keeping it 100, though, man, I was a little scared because... If it was confirmed, so, you know, a weapon, like I said earlier, is in use, they they can use lethal force. So, you know, I'd end up being the victim just as well. So, well, it's go time. So, uh, I just, I'm behind this dude in the pill line, man, and I just started blasting the dude from the side and just stayed on him. And the dude was fighting, though. <laughs> so, it, it's not it's not how people think, man. Like, you don't just stab someone and it's over. Yeah, it's a little bit you know, more complex, uh, people, people's uh, fight or flight kicks in, man, and you'd be surprised the strength some people have, you know, including myself, I've been in situations where I was surprised at my own strength, and, uh, you know, so the dude hit the ground, man, and I, I still staying on him, stabbing him, and I ended up bending a knife in the dude's head, and so I just took the knife and just chucked it as far as I could, and uh, threw, the, threw it as far away as I could and stuff, and um, I, I mean, obviously later I found out I ended up hitting the dude 11 times and just, I just beat on him, ground and pound, you know, after, after I'd stabbed him and stuff. And they put the yard down and, you know, they're trying to throw grenades at him. I just kept going, kept going. You know, they had the old school sticks back then and, uh, they pretty much beat me off the dude with the little extra stick therapy for not complying. You know, they gave me the Rodney King treatment. But, uh, you know, it was over after that, and I didn't really feel nothing at the time anyway because of my adrenaline. You know, my adrenaline was going, and, you know, but later had quite a headache, you know, and uh, I ended up getting a four-year shoe for that, uh, all said and done. But I had only had, by that time, six months left, and so I ended up paroling from the hole six months later. And... uh you know, I gave him every bit of that shoe in violations of Chino, which was a whole different world. But um, this is pretty much our training ground, you know, where we were taught discipline and anything that's important in the political world was there, you know, at Chino and Palm Hall. At one time or another, you know, either on violations or in and out to court from the Bay, Corkin or to Hatchby, you know, if a brand member was there, 
you know, it was their spot, and they ran it, you know, and uh, once they left, it was up to them to leave the keys with whoever, but most of the time, it was Peni, you know, this was pretty much how it was on all yards. Peni was the foot soldiers for the brand, because unlike uh, NLR, you know, we were never validated as a prison gang. We were created on the streets, and only jumped in dudes on the street at that time. You know, years later in the late 90s, that changed, and P and I started bringing dudes in in prison. You know, everyone in prison wanted to be P and I because, you know, we were the hitmen for the brand, and we were really starting to get recognition. The problem was the once handful of dudes that were like family, myself included, began to branch off and uh, begin creating our own followers, you know, who were loyal to us or, uh, you know, basically uh, head started bumping after that, you know, because a lot of us created our own little circles and, you know, whatnot. And, um, you know, it was uh, basically it all came down to power and control, man. And, and, and in a nutshell, um, who was closest to the brand? Uh, you know, it was every day, though, somebody was getting life flighted off the many yards at Chino. Uh, where we were on, you know, we had mandatory yard, and we worked out military style and stayed on your toes, man. And, you know, every day, you know, every time a kite comes to your cell, you know, your adrenaline starts running, and you pay attention to any demeanor changes in your celly or vice versa. Like, you never knew when you were going to be asked to kill your celly or, again, vice versa. You know, it's not a fun way to live, but, you know, it's a dog-eat-dog world in here. And... Only the strong survive, pretty much. You're either you have 60 seconds remaining. You're either a predator or prey, in simple terms. So, this was how I lived my life, man. Throughout 